A fun passage here uh, this week and a fun passage next week. Uh, It's fun to kind of have to dig into things that you're like, ooh, okay, this is a little bit of a challenge. And, uh, you know, sometimes you kind of read it like, okay, this is easy. Let me just kind of think about some illustrations. This one's more like, all right, I got to read some things. I got to get, I I need to pick my words carefully. Um, But at the end of the day, you know, what this passage is kind of about is it's kind of about prayer. You know, like even when all this kind of, some deep theological things that we're going to kind of try to break down and understand, at the end of the day, it kind of comes back to prayer and the importance of prayer and God's expectation of prayer. We're going to be talking about that a little bit next week as well. Um, you know, when we talk about prayer, it is something that, when, especially when people identify as Christians, we're dealing with, you know, 90 plus percent of people pray. Like, we're all praying uh, at different times of the day. Now, setting aside time for prayer, that percentage goes way down. Uh, but the idea of prayer is there. And I think a lot of us have that feeling like, yeah, no, I pray. I mean, I feel like I should be praying a little bit more. Uh, And I don't want us trapped in the thought, and this is something that can easily happen to us, that, you know, we ask, do we read the Bible? We say yes. Do you read the Bible enough? Then you say, well, no. Do you pray? Yes. Well, do you pray enough? Well, I don't know if it's enough. Because none of us want to say enough. Like, saying that enough piece makes it feel like, well, I think I'm always supposed to do more, right? What if you were praying 80 hours a week? Would that be enough? They'd be like, never enough, it has to be more. I think the answer can't always be more and more and more. Uh, I do think we need to be just faithful to what God is asking us to do. And uh, if you do have that feeling of like, yeah, I feel like I am supposed to be setting aside more time in prayer, I think that could be a, an accurate assessment. Uh, but here's just a couple quotes on, on prayer that I had um, grabbed that I really like. Uh, this guy, uh, all just different theologians and pastors throughout history. Uh, Uh, Pastor Alan Redpath says, there is too much working before men and too little waiting before God. If we took 1% of the energy we put into trying to make things happen and invested that into prayer, we would see an exponential increase of blessings. Uh, Pastor George McDonald says, in whatever man does without God, he must fail miserably. Or Or if he succeeds, more miserably. Like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, like, even if we succeed, it should be even worse for us. Uh, Andrew Murray, the 19th century preacher, says, the man who mobilizes the Christian church to pray will make the greatest contribution to world evangelism and history. And Charles Spurgeon used to say regularly, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. Uh, The idea of prayer being valuable is something that is all throughout Scripture, that being able to recognize, okay, my role is to ask God, my job is to ask God to do his job. My role is to ask God to do his role. Uh, And and when we are dependent on God in prayers, I think we'll see some amazing things. We're going to go into 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to go through uh, verses 1 through 7. Uh, Again, starts out very expected, and then kind of has this little phrase in here that I think at surface makes perfect sense. Uh, that God desires all people to be saved, we'd be like, well, of course he does. Uh, And then when we start thinking about it, we start realizing there's some challenges in this. But let's make sure we can get there first. Um, The first thing that we're going to see is man's role. You'll see man's role, God's role, Jesus' role, our role. So man's role is kind of the first thing we see here. First of all, then I urge that supplications, supplications is just really another word for prayers that are, prayer is the generic term. And prayer encompasses lots of things. Uh, Supplication is you asking God to supply something. You have a need, God supply this health. Supply the finances. You know, supply, uh, you know, food. We are asking him to supply something. Supplication. I urge that supplications and prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving. So intercessions is praying for someone else. That we did that this morning. I was, what are your prayer requests? Let me pray for them. That's interceding. So when you hear of other people's needs, you are interceding on their behalf. And this would be even more common uh, with people that uh, they don't, you know, you know they don't really have a relationship with God yet. You would intercede for them. If you know they're not, you know, they're, they're growing in their faith, they're kind of learning how to pray, you intercede for them. And so he talks about all these prayers, supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving be made for all people. 
for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. All right, and so he's saying praying for all people. All right, so there should be prayers for all different sorts of people. This is just the word anthropos, like praying for all mankind. All right, praying for kings and all who are in high positions. So one of our roles is to pray for our political leaders in our particular instance, praying for our president, praying for our Congress, praying for governors and others in high positions, all right, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. The, the, the recognition of praying for them is what we are doing to enact change is prayer. I, I'm, I'm certainly not saying I don't think there's ever a time to protest. I'm not saying there is never a time to uh, stand up, but our what he has called Christians to do is to lead a peaceful, quiet life, godly, dignified in every way. That, you know, we can't look at today and say, yeah, but he did not understand the two-party system of Republicans and Democrats. we got to fight. And, and I say, yeah, because it was actually much worse than that when this was being written. You know, when, when this is being written, uh, this is there is a single-party rule in Rome all right, with a Caesar that oversaw this entire Roman government. This is at a time where Christians are being persecuted, not just like, you know, oh, they're, you know, we're, they're being spoken negatively about uh, in the stone tablet news. Uh, it is that they are like actually being kicked out of homes, killed. What would have been a common practice in this area of the world is um, if you weren't willing, and this is something we see um, as we start reading um, in Revelation, so within, you know, 20 to 30 years after this is being talked about, uh, we see a little insight on kind of how the guilds worked, that what persecution looked like in a lot of senses is if you weren't willing to join the local trade guild, whatever it is you did, you did woodworking, you did uh, stonework, you uh, sold fabrics, you were working the, you know, the imports on the docks, whatever it is that you did, there would be some sort of guild, and usually in that guild there would be some sort of false god worship, and if you weren't willing to participate in that false god worship, then I guess you didn't want to be part of the guild. All right, if you didn't want to be part of the guild, you couldn't work. And so you were constantly like being chased out of towns, being cut off from work, having your business threatened. I mean, this is persecution on another level. And his, his solution for this, pray for those people in high positions. All right, and his goal is for us to lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified. So, you know, we saw in the news, we were praying for it briefly this morning, just the, uh, like the Palestinian and uh, Israeli, uh, the Palestinian and yeah, Israeli conflict that's happening between Hamas and the IDF. And uh, I mean, it's, it's so tough. I know what we want is peace. We need like ceasefire. Come on, let's, how do we, how do we solve this? And, you know, anytime somebody says like, oh, it's so simple. This is how this is solved. It's not simple. This is not going to be a simple solution. This has not been simple over the last couple of decades. It will not be a simple solution uh, in the future. I do say when people, I've been asked a lot, you know, when people, anytime war erupts over there, I start getting asked, like, is this the end times, Joe? And I'm like, well, we're closer today than we were yesterday. Um, but uh, I, I, I said I'm never quick to say, well, yeah, I mean, is this a war and a rumor of wars and seeing things? I'm like, yeah. Are we seeing things that, you know, if we were having this conversation a hundred years ago, I'd be saying like, well, yeah, it's kind of hard to tell though. And then 1948, Israel is now a nation again. And now all the prophecies in Revelation talking about Israel seem to make a lot more sense. Maybe he actually means Israel when he's talking about Israel. And so we're like, okay, so yeah, it seemed a little closer now than we did a hundred years ago when there wasn't a nation of Israel. Um, the thing I always look for is this. I will stand up here and say, Okay, I, yeah, I think it's really close. Now, I'm not saying we are to wait until this happens, like, oh, don't get your life together yet, you know. Who cares how messed up your life is until this happens? Nope, we are always to be ready. The Lord's return can happen at any moment, and God can, like, solve all these, uh, you know, start doing all these prophecies at the end. I do always say, though, if I will stand up here and say, okay, I think that's the Antichrist, or I think we're really, really close when there is like a real peace treaty between Israel 
and Palestine. If Israel is allowed to rebuild the temple there uh, on the Temple Mount, if there is some kind of brokered peace treaty, like an actual celebrated peace treaty, I'm going to be like, oh man, that could be the peace treaty that's talked about in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, I'll be a little more, I think it could be that. Uh, right now, this war unfortunately is so similar to the wars that have been going on for decades in that area. And, and there is a mentality that we have at times, and I know it, we kind of feel it, and I know what we would do as Americans, like, and this is Anytime we have been attacked as Americans, like, we obliterate the other side. Like, we, we absolutely, like, we kick butt and take names, and it's just kind of the history of what has happened. And so we have this mentality of, if that happened to us, if we were attacked, we would, we would go to war. And it is a tough thing, but with, as Christians, there should be this mentality of, when we are seeing things in conflict, our, our prayer should be peace. When we're seeing our own conflict against our government, our prayer should be for God to supply our needs. Uh, we should be thankful for what we do have. That God is not actually calling us to a violent kingdom. God is not calling us to fight for our rights. God is not calling us to fight for our way of life. He is actually asking us to pray for these things, to live a peaceful and quiet and dignified life. Now, this is hard. I, I've, I've talked about my different kind of feelings of war and things like that, that uh, for the third time now, I've gone to like the Holocaust Museum in, um, in Israel a couple months ago, and, and you, you can't walk through there and start like seeing what went on, and you're just like, this, like, this is evil. Like, and to think that like evil is happening so much worse today, Nope, we have always figured out how to do evil to each other. Uh, there was a lot of evil going on in the 1930s and 40s. There's a lot of evil going on today. Uh, but we've always been figured out how people can be evil to other people. And, you know, uh, would that have continued if America didn't jump in and step in and stop it? Oh, yeah. I don't see how that would have happened. I don't know how it would have happened differently. If, uh, you know, again, outside of God moving in some different way. But you can almost see that, like, all right, did God rise up this nation to be able to stop all the other nations? Like, we could stop them all. Uh, and when we went over there, uh, my favorite story is um, Hungary, the country of Hungary, that was siding with the... Um, had sided with the Germans and started rounding up the Jewish people and started putting them into internment camps and killing them. And then the second that we landed on Normandy and started marching across the, uh, the, the continent, they switched sides and started fighting, uh, started fighting uh, Germany from the other side. And like they kind of were, they were going to join whoever the biggest bully on the block was. And when it was Germany, they fought with Germany. And when it was us, they fought with us. Uh, and so, like, there is this role of when you see evil, are you going to stop it? So I can't, I, I'm not going to over-interpret the verses to say there is never an instance for war, that there is never an instance for uh, fighting. What I would say is uh, where, where I see it the most complicated in history is when the church at the time, the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, were the ones going to war, when they were the ones that were instigating fighting. And I say there's the instance in which, you know, the church itself shouldn't ever be in part of this. Now, so would we as a church ever want to side with and say, yes, we want to go to war. Yes, we want to condone fighting. Yes, we want to, you know, we want this conflict to end. What our role should always be as the church is, yep, we are praying for our kings and those in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life and dignified. Now, it might have to be a role where, we are drafted, or we have those that have enlisted in the military, and they need to fight, and that there is a, a role to defend our country, and we're being obedient to our leaders and elders in that. That can be a role, but I, uh, what, we want our, what we want believers characterized as are two things. Number one, that we are dependent on God. All right? Our characteristics, what we are characterized by is our dependence on God. All right, so we are to be dependent on God, and we want people to see that. We aren't dependent on our government freedoms. We aren't dependent on our tax-exempt status. 
we aren't dependent on uh, anything that is provided by the government. What we are dependent on is God. And that we are, that is who we are trusting, that is who we are relying on, that is who we are praying, that is who we are praising to, that is our dependence on God. And the second thing that is characterizing us uh, is that peaceable, quiet, and then that word, word that we maybe, I, I wouldn't know exactly what it means, I had to look it up, that dignity, all right, that we're to be char- characterized by reverence and respect. And this is respect for others, but mostly uh, respect for God and reverence for God. So our characteristic should be one of peace our characteristic should be one of quietness our characteristic should be one of godliness our characteristic should be that of being dignified with with reverence and respect so um again what what we are to display in our lives in times of war and again many in our lifetime we have not actually faced that uh maybe we have faced some very minor in the scheme of the world in the scheme of the universe in the scheme of history very minor political um you know conflict you know as much as we were watching things going on in 2020 and little seeing cities burning and as much as we saw you know conflicts in the capital and as much as we've seen like political rhetoric if you listen to uh talk radio in the news that we can see like oh it's so bad Yes, but then there are other countries that like are facing coups all the time. You know, there are there are countries. Uh, Haiti, uh, for example, you know, Haiti has not had a, a a government last for more than 13 years. So, like their most recent one, uh, three years ago, again, it collapsed. They wrote a new constitution. You know, like our constitution has lasted since like 1780 something. Like we we have a pr- decently long continual reign of unbroken government and. Haiti's never made it more than 13 years, and so we'll see how long this government lasts before another, you know, military general says, no, we don't like it, we're cutting in. <laughs> you know, that that's kind of keeps happening in a lot of countries that like, oh man, like there are political conflicts much worse, and the Christians in those countries, they'd say the same thing. Um, you know, you're not dependent on your government for your freedom. You're not dependent on your government to be able to worship and glorify God and honor him. And what should your character is, what should you be characterized as? Should be characterized as peaceful people. And you're characterized as people who are reverent and respectful. Um, when we get into verse 3 is where it starts getting interesting. All right, is where, okay, this is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. When we are a people of peace, when we are a people of dignity, when we're a people of respect, this is what it is. Who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So when I connect it to the previous passage, there's one thing that I kind of see like, yeah. When what we see is the reason why God would want us to be peaceful, the reason why God wants us to not be in conflict and, uh, and things like that and praying for all people is he desires for people to be saved. And so the idea of if we were in conflict with another country, um, you know, it, it's easy to look at, like, uh, the way my grandfather would kind of, like, talk about the Japanese and the way he would say the Japanese. You could tell there was this, like, you know, like, eh, that Pops, you can't talk like that anymore. You don't want to say that. He was a kid in 1941 when they were bombed, and he's just like, eh, doesn't trust them. Doesn't trust them. Every, every little calculator, and he's like, could be a bomb. I'm not going to use this one. You know, like, he, there's still this thought that, like, he kind of doesn't like them. And yet, I grew up, I have, like, literally zero negative thoughts towards the Japanese. You know, like, why would I? <laughs> I, I have zero negative thought. And, and so it's easy for me to look at the Japanese and be like, well, of course I want the Japanese to be saved. Uh, it is the largest unreached country in the world. There are more unsaved people in Japan, which is a very populous country, from a population standpoint, percentage than almost any other country in the world. Uh, so the Japanese people are atheistic. You know, what came out of what, Shin, you know, what kind of evolved out of Shintoism into just kind of a secular humanism. Uh, this is, they are not religious. They do not believe in God. They are atheistic. Uh, more so than there's a lot of people throughout years, they kind of have a concept of God. Japanese are atheistic. I want the Japanese to be saved. There's, there's some ministry there. It's hard ministry there. Uh, and so, like, I look at them and I want them to be saved. I have no feelings of conflict to the Japanese. I have no feelings of conflict towards the Germans or anybody else in Europe. 
All right, and so what would I have to fast forward today? Probably my most, you know, natural anti reaction would be like Muslims, Muslim extremists, Arab extremists. Like, what were the quote unquote enemies in my childhood? The enemies of my era would have most likely been Middle Eastern men. And so, should I have any concern, where, where should they be my enemy? Or should I desire for them to be saved? Should I desire Hamas' leaders to be saved? Should I desire the people of Gaza to be saved? Should I desire the Palestinian people to be saved? Do I want them, do I desire, do I desire them to be saved? Do I, when I, do I see the solution to this conflict as, oh, but if they were to trust Jesus as my Savior, then we could actually be brothers and sisters. And so if my desire is for them to be saved, now God's telling us. You know why that should be your desire? Because that's my desire. My desire is for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. If that's my desire and you're my follower, that should be your desire. All right, and so the question is, does God want, and I don't want us to look at Israel, like, would we want the people of Israel and the people of Palestine to both get saved and to both trust Jesus as their Savior, to both be welcome to the kingdom of God? Yes, that should be our desire. And why should it be our desire? Because it's God's desire. All right, and so one way we, we can immediately see maybe where the conflict is here in verse 4, who desires all people to be saved. The natural thought of like, oh, this is weird. When we start saying, who do I desire? Well, like, if God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, and God's will is all-powerful, well then, why doesn't everybody get saved then? If God desires for everyone to be saved, and God is all-powerful and does whatever he wants, and whatever God's will is God's will, if God's will for everyone to be saved, then why isn't everybody saved? All right? And so that kind of was like, all right, so is it really your will, God? Let's break it down in a couple pieces. There is potential, potential, that, and, and why, I, why I'm saying it like that is because I actually don't think this is the way we should interpret it. <laughs> uh, but there is potential that his statement of who desires all people to be saved, once again, we're seeing this word anthropos, this mankind, this he desires mankind, that he could be saying, he's not saying he wants every single person to be saved. What he's saying is he wants all people groups to be saved. He want, there isn't a, and we certainly know this to be true. Like, it, it isn't like God's like, yes, I want the Japanese saved. Yes, the Germans saved. Polish, yes, I want the Dutch saved. Yes, like, like does he, is there like a people that he doesn't want saved? Of course not. There's no, he's not going through different groups of people and being like, ah, I don't know about them. They're, they're a mess. You know? No, he desires all people groups to be saved. There is not a people group that God is like, no, I don't want this, uh, you know, I don't want this South American tribe to be saved. He wants all peoples to be saved. So is it potential? It is. Um, do I think that's what he's going for here? I, I don't think so. I, I think there'd be other ways to kind of express that. We do see that kind of expression in Matthew 24. Uh, that he does talk about wanting to see people from every tribe, tongue, and nation around the earth to be saved. So we know that's his desire. I don't think this is what it's talking about here. I do think it is talking about those. We, we pray for all people, and we pray for kings, and we pray for leaders to be saved. We pray for that because God wants them to be saved. Where I would break this down a little bit more is to say what I think it is revealing is God's nature his feelings, his desire is being used where these are all hard words for us to describe with God. We know that God does have emotions, but we know they're not like ours. God has feelings, but we know they're not like ours. Our feelings and emotions are based off of our circumstances uh, and the, whether the unexpected or expected things that happen that our emotions are based on what is unveiling in front of us where God's emotions aren't linked to that because he knows all things. But he is trying to use words that would maybe make sense to us as people. And so he's just being used, that his desires, his will, to give us something that maybe we can understand. That it's just talking about his nature is one of desiring for people to be saved. That if you are asking a yes or no question, 
And this is like, how can we do such, how do we boil complex theology down to yes or no's? Does God want people to be saved? Yes. How do I know that? Because God's actions have revealed themselves to be one that cares about salvation. He created mankind. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world to save sinners. The only person that didn't deserve to die chose to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus taking on all of the sins of mankind, putting them on his shoulders, the Father pouring out his wrath on the Son. He buried, raised again three days later, awaits in heaven ready to prepare a place for anyone who believes and trusts in him. To say that God doesn't care about the salvation of people is stupid. That's illogical. Like Everything in Scripture is showing us that God cares about the salvation of his people. If we switch the question around and say, if it was God's will for people to not be saved, if we are saying that if it was God's will for people to face the judgment for their sins, if that's the way this sentence read, for it is God's will that people face the, their justice and judgment for their own sins, well then that would be the situation. Everyone would be punished for their own sins and we'd all be in hell and God would still be good and righteous and holy. He would still be all those things if everybody went to hell. The fact that there are people in heaven and that there are people who get saved reveals that God desires it to be so. <laughs> that God desires it to be so. And so we can at least agree that we are dealing with uh, a God who desires people to be saved. So there's a couple things we can kind of take from this, and then I'll still try to make sure we can answer this bigger question. When we look at God's role here, salvation is provided for all. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. What Christ did on the cross is good enough for all mankind. There is not something else God would have to do. It's not like uh, what Jesus did on the cross is good to save, I don't know, about a billion people. And if you're going to try to save more, you've got to do more. What Jesus did on the cross was good enough to save everyone. He provided, he provided salvation for all. Second thing is that salvation should be offered to all. When we think about what our role is, and we go back to man's role, our role is it should be offered to everybody. There isn't a person that shouldn't be offered salvation. There isn't a people group, there isn't a nation, a race, or anybody that's like, yep, don't bring salvation to that group, they don't deserve it. Nope, nobody deserves the gospel. It should be offered to everyone. Whether they were murderers on death row, it should be offered to them. All right, um, whatever we are talking about, whoever we are talking about, we should offer salvation. Thirdly, is that people are to blame if they're not saved. God is not to blame. God sent his only son Jesus down the cross for the sins of the world. Has it written down in scripture? Has it being proclaimed throughout the earth? No person is, there is no one other than people to blame if they don't trust Jesus as their savior. We don't get to blame anything else. We don't get to blame God if someone who doesn't get saved. People are to blame. People are the ones who rebelled against God. People are the ones who sin. People are the ones that are too prideful to turn to God. People are the ones that nobody deserves salvation. So the only blame that should go around is for people. But now let's get back to this kind of big theological question. And there is kind of, you know, in this space, there are kind of two... You know, I'm not a big fan of labels, but just to kind of simplify when we talk about labels, there is the more Calvinistic side, or if you want to say kind of sovereign grace side of the argument, and then there is kind of the more Armelian free will side of the argument. This side has a very easy answer to this, and because they kind of use these terms of um, permissive will versus perfect will. So the perfect will of God would be for everyone to get saved. The permissive will is basically saying that like, but God allows people to choose what they want to choose. God allows, like God shares this grace with everyone, and then it is up to mankind whether or not they're going to believe in this or not. There is human will that God has chosen to work through. So this side of the argument is kind of saying, it's, it's a, this, they have other challenges and difficulties, but in this area, 
really easy answer. Yep, God desires for all people to be saved. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he proclaims the gospel throughout the earth, and people are going to believe or reject. The other side of the argument here, again, the more Calvinistic free will side, is looking at this, and they're like, okay, this is complicated. This is difficult. If God desires for all people to be saved, why aren't it never be saved? If God is the only one who saves, and we would look and say, like, yeah, nobody gets saved without God ordaining it. No one gets saved unless God chooses them. No one gets saved unless God predestines them. So if he desires for everyone to be saved, go ahead and predestine everybody then. Why doesn't God just choose everyone for salvation? All right, And the answer to that question is, yeah, we don't fully understand God. And in some way, shape, or form, God is glorified by him choosing some and allowing others to continue to live a life of destruction. And what we would see is the argument is usually used for like in Sodom and Gomorrah and Egypt are the two examples that we see used a lot in scripture of, yeah, it's because God punished Sodom and Gomorrah. It's because God punished the Egyptians. It's because God hardened the heart of Pharaoh that we can then see what death and destruction and rejection of God looks like. And now we praise and glorify God because we're like, wow, he, he saved us and he protected us and he loves us. And we can only, it's easier to identify when we have the contrast. When we see what it is like for those that have rejected God, we are then compelled and desire to praise God on a greater, deeper level. So the general answer is, we see that God has this general desire for salvation, and yet he expresses it through saving some. And when he saves some, we are then praising him that he chose us for salvation. There is no ifs, ands, or buts, and whatever side you kind of fall on the challenges, there is no doubt this human responsibility that comes in somewhere in the equation. And everybody kind of expresses it a little differently. Uh, And this is why I like the statement that whatever, however you kind of align, we still have to fall with that point number three. That people are to blame. That God isn't to blame if someone is not saved. We see God's heart and desire. We see his nature is one of someone who desires people to be saved. He created people in his image. He loves people. Uh, And even if there are going to be people that reject God, that rejection, the blame for that is on people. The blame for that is humans that have rebelled against God and their rebellion is so great. Uh, Not that God couldn't overcome it, but that he has uh, chosen to allow them to go into that path. But this is where I I, I love this little phrase, and and again, this is the value of kind of like, I'm reading this scripture myself, and I didn't notice this until I read a commentary that pointed it out. And I was like, oh, I didn't read it that way. Where who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Where what God is saying is not, what, what his desire is here, is for people to be saved and to come, that this willingly, he desires that people willingly come. This side is obviously still having no problem. What the Calvinistic answer would be like, what we see is that if you ask what God's desire is, he desires for people to come to the knowledge of the truth. He desires for people to come to him to salvation. What it is not addressing is that if you give humanity this opportunity to come to Jesus. The question is, how many would come? And the more, the farther you are on this, if it's a spectrum that we're looking at here, the farther you are to this side of the spectrum and getting against this wall here, you would say that like, yeah, if you give opportunity for people to be saved, zero people would come. (laughs) Zero people would choose to follow God on their own. If God's desire It's for all people to come to salvation that Jesus stands out there and says, I want all to come. Who would come for salvation? And there are Bible verses and there are those who would say that it seems like no one would come. (laughs) That a total of zero people would come, even though it's God's desire. And so now it comes down to what is God going to do about it? 
And you can say, well, he saved some. He reaches out and he saves some. And if that's the way he works, this is kind of always that tough thing where I kind of align, where I kind of fall. I always kind of say, I don't know, I think I'm somewhere over here. Um, is I say I'm okay with however God chose to operate. <laughs> that if God chose to operate in a world where he offered salvation to everyone and everyone like just went back to like that didn't pay attention and didn't care. And God's like, you got to be kidding me. All right. And so he says, okay, come on. Let's hey, put your phone. Look at me. Look. Oh, wow. This is amazing. Yeah, come on. Like if he is choosing and dragging people to salvation, uh, if that's how God chooses to operate, I'm okay with that. And if God chooses to operate more like, hey, you know, and like get your attention. And there are some that's like, wow, Jesus really did that for me. I did. Come on. Let me tell you more. And that as those that are interested and those that are and believe God kind of enlightens and allows them to kind of see the kingdom of God for what it can be and they get saved, I'm okay if God kind of goes with the grace for all and those who believe then be saved. I'm okay with it either way. And my answer is I trust God kind of however he chooses to operate. And I think there's a lot of godly people on both sides of the spectrum. When we get to heaven... I don't think there's going to be this drum roll like, who was right? None of you were. Okay, this is how this actually works, people. You know, like, here's how it is like, oh, this is even better than I thought. Like, there we go. Your brains just couldn't get there. Uh, Like, you you were confused how time works. So let me take away time. And now does it make sense? Um, I, I think there is, like, you know, the idea of, Arminians or Calvinists, Calvinists not going to heaven is crazy. All right? If you believe and trust in Jesus, you, you, you're going to spend an eternity in heaven because of God's promises. Uh, and I do say that we can clearly see that there's God's desire for people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And now is that some kind of clue to say that he desires people to come and yet they don't? Or is he simply saying, I desire all people to come and some will and some won't? Yeah, I'm not sure which way he's going with that, but I can see the heart of God here no matter what. And I can see that God provided salvation for all. I know that he wants us to offer salvation to all, and I know that it's human's fault uh, if they don't believe. Uh, And his kind of answer to that, and this is how we know that we know this is Jesus-centric, is his proof of that all, he desires all people to be saved, is Jesus. His proof is, look, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. No one would say that Jesus isn't committed to the salvation of mankind. He is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is on his knees, sweating blood, saying, may this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will. And he stands up as Jewish officials come to arrest him, and he stops his disciples and he says, nope, this is the will of God. I do this willingly. I go willingly. And he goes into custody, ultimately leading to his death on the cross, which resulted in the salvation of mankind. That, that what, however horrible the physical torment of the cross was, it doesn't compare to the spiritual torment of the father turning his back on him having him become sin personified, God's wrath being poured out on him. Um, But as we know, three days later, he rose from the dead. No one argues that Jesus isn't committed to salvation. And here's the argument. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is one mediator between God and man. That's Jesus, 100% God, 100% man. Jesus, I don't even have to say it, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. So he's like, Jesus obviously was willing to be the savior of the world, ransom for all. So here's what Jesus did. It, if Jesus is God, and Jesus, perfect meter between God and man, Jesus is committed to salvation, it's easy to say that God is committed to salvation. <laughs> that God is committed to salvation because Jesus is and Jesus is God. All right, law of transitive property. So what we see here, easy, Jesus is the perfect mediator. All right, where if, he is, if his goal is to bring God and man together, okay, that's what we're saying Jesus came to do. 
He is, if God's desire for all men to be saved, Jesus makes perfect sense. He, become, he is both God and man, and he's saying, hey guys, okay, come on, come on, come on. Here we go. There we go. All right. This is nice. I like this. You know? And so he is bringing God and man together, and he is the perfect one to do that because he is both God and man. He, is, he understands both. He is both. He thinks both. He's, he, uh, and so he is the one to unite. All right? And he is the perfect sacrifice. He is the one that can take on the wrath of God. He is the one that can share the effects of grace with fellow man. So he is the perfect mediator, the perfect sacrifice, and he is the example for this, for the one, for the reason. We're saying for because it's like, this is my proof for why I can make the statement that God desires all people to be saved because we know there's one God and we know there's one mediator between God and man who is the sacrifice for all. all right? And so there's this, this unity in that. Following me? Is this making sense? A couple confused faces. Probably should do Q&A, gosh. Q&A now? <laughs> Q&A. I, I'll give you four minutes. What questions do you have that I can help kind of answer on a theological basis? Yes, sir. <laughs> you can't wish for more wishes. That's the standard... Standard genie rules. You can't wish for more genies. You can't miss for more wishes. <laughs> uh, what else other than that? Can I, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm with you. And let me just pause you there, because everyone would agree with that. Whatever side of the spectrum you're on, everyone would agree that we don't come to God on our own. If it wasn't for God's actions on the cross, of course no one would get saved. Of course no one was, like, reaching out for God. God reached out to us. Man did not reach out to God. God stepped down from heaven to deal with us, not us step up to God to, to connect with him. Keep going. You didn't want to over and over. The great, it's, the, it's a great question. Why does he choose some for others? And the only thing I can answer is um, the opposite of that question in that there, there isn't actually, like, it's nothing based on you. Meaning he doesn't look for people and be like, all right, I need a bassist for the choir. He is not basing it off of our skills, abilities, potential capabilities. He is, he, the, we know this little expression, like he doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Like he, he loves the weak, he loves the broken, that they shine forth more. So why is the perfect question, why does he save some and not others? And the answer is we don't know. It is he chooses whom he chooses. All right, he, uh, and it is not based on us, it's something based on him, but what is he basing it on? We actually don't, above our pay grade. It is above what we could ever understand. And you, we can try to make some kind of argument of like, he knows the future, he knows what we would believe, and that's why he chooses us back here. We can say that, nope, it is nothing. He chooses some and not others. Ah, but we don't know. Follow up? Mm-hmm. Yes. So, great. Um, what I would say is we got everybody, we got a room of 100 people that they're all, hey, across the cliff is a fiery burning inferno. And you're like, I know. And you're still walking in it? Yep. That people are rejecting and rebelling against God, whatever they know to be right and wrong, they break those right and wrongs. Their people are so sinful that even when they make up their own morality, they break it. So why I can blame humanity no matter what is 
everyone has rebelled and rejected God. Everyone has rebelled and sinned against whatever concept they have of morality. So every person, there isn't going to be a person that was like, I was actually, I actually thought I was truly good. Everybody breaks even their own conscience, something that God has written on the hearts of all mankind. So I can blame all people because they have wronged God and rebelled and rejected him. Every single person. Every person has. So I can blame them. Um, if they don't get saved, it is my fault, their fault. The thing that's not fair is that God would save me. There is nothing that I have done that would say that like, yeah, you should have saved me, God. And like, the only reason I saved you is that I keep my promises. And when I put my faith and trust in Jesus, God kept his promise as he always will and always does. So that's how I would blame people. That's great. Great questions. Yeah. Um, yes. So the ability, so the, the a, a, a potential, and that's why I said, I, I want you to know this is a potential that God could be saying, here is salvation, and I offer it to all, and any may believe. And this is where some would say that, like, yes, there are some, if God offers his salvation to all. There are some who read it and believe and are saved, and we call that like, yep, people have free will to believe. This side is saying no humanity is so depraved that if they had the choice, they'll always choose no. That this side is saying if they had a choice, their choice would be no, and that we see that over and over again. And, and this side is saying that yes, if God didn't act and wasn't so blatant with his grace and his love, then people would reject. So when I talk about the will, I, I don't have any problem saying that humans have will. What I would easily say is that, you know, if our will comes against God's will, who wins? God's will does. If I, if I am grabbing the horns of a Brahma bull and we say go, it doesn't matter how hard I push, whatever the bull decides to do is what's happening. <laughs> if it decides to gore me, and then that's what's happening. And if it decides to lay down and fall asleep, I'll be like, yep, yeah, good boy, that's what I wanted. Like, <laughs> whatever it wants to do, it does. And so the question is, if our will goes against God's will, who wins? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, God wins. Okay, so then the question is, what does God want to do? How is God choosing to operate? And I think it is worth digging into Scripture and not going off of what I think happens but let me do a fair evaluation of what Scripture says. And I don't want to say that, like, you are going to see it as a clear and obvious answer. No, I'm saying is, huh, there's a couple verses on both sides that are a little challenging, and I want to try to, I want to, try to understand Scripture as much as I can, but there are, like, you know, if you, if you want to put as highest priority, like Romans, like, you know, um, 7, 8, 9, 6, 7, 8, 9, you read, like, you get to chapter 9, and you're like, oh, man, gosh, God just does whatever he wants, and it doesn't matter what we do. And then, again, you kind of read 1 Peter 1, and you're like, no, what humans want to do, God's giving us choices, and he made us free will beings, and choose God. Don't reject him. People, slap you across the face. Like, I, I, and so, like, what we can't do is say, I'm a 1 Peter 1 kind of Christian. And the other two are like, well, I'm a Romans 9 kind of Christian. They're all in the Bible. All right, so how are we... How are we reconciling these challenges? Um, a, we look at kind of what is happening in context, what is happening historically that he's saying this, and then there are going to be times that we just have to live in tension a little bit, saying that it's probably more complex than my human brain can fully grasp. Um, and I've always liked the illustration that um, Charles Spurgeon's used, I've used it before, that like, on this side of the door, it says, you know, choose ye who will enter. Like, oh, like, whoever wants to enter heaven, come on in. And you open the door, and you go through, and then you turn around and etched in stone that's been there for a thousand years, it says, welcome, Joe. And you're like, how the heck did he know that I was going to come through that door? And so on this side, I felt like, on this side of the door, I have no idea what God's doing over there. I have no idea what God is thinking. And whatever gets me to go through the door, I do my will, my desire, whatever. I don't know what got me through, but I got through the door. And then once I'm on that side and I start looking into it, I'm like, oh, I think God might have been doing some things.
to get me to open that door. <laughs> and so I, I, I kind of say, I think it's like, when we talk to people, we don't need to make it complex. Hey, this is what Jesus is offering you. He loves you. He cares for you. He died on the cross for your sins. Trust him to be your savior. And then they do that and be like, no, I want you to start thinking about how we got here and got to this point and how you heard this. And you start reading scripture you're like, whoa, I think God might have been doing something in me before this. How, how did God know I was going to? And so that's kind of, that was Charles Spurgeon's best way of trying to describe it. And I, I don't think I can do better. There's another hand in the back there. Anybody else? Can't do this every week. Oh, oh she beat you. She beat you. I got, I got a law of speed. Yeah. Well, oh, you're, you're, you're relinquishing? All right. That's her choice. <laughs> the, we have the power of our own salvation. We know. So, no, what I'm saying is when people, when people go to hell, and they actually have, maybe, I don't know what God does or doesn't do, um, I get a little weird story, a weird little glimpse in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man goes to hell, and his request isn't, save me, I didn't know, please give me another chance. In hell, he simply says, can I have a dip your tip of your finger in water, might quench my thirst, and go tell my family. My family doesn't know. Go tell. Send someone to go tell. Go send Lazarus to go tell my family. He has enough wisdom in heaven to know he wants relief, or excuse me, in hell. He knows he wants relief, but what he ultimately wants is for his family to be saved. Uh, it's one of the things I'll do at a funeral if I'm at someone that I actually don't know as a believer or not. I make this little statement that I said, if they could speak to you today, they would tell you that they would want you to trust Jesus as their Savior. Because whether they're in heaven, they would want you there. And if they're in hell, they would not want you there. But I don't say that part because it kind of is a funeral. and kind of. So I just kind of say, if they were here today, I know what they would say. I know they would say they want you to trust Jesus as their Savior. And so every person in hell, all right, who is to blame for their destruction? Them. Their sin, their rejection of God, and their rejection of what anything they knew to be right and wrong, as we see kind of in Romans 1. God wrote laws on their hearts and they broke them, broke it. And so um, my blame of humanity is their sinfulness is the reason for hell. Their rejection is the reason for hell. It is not God sending them there. It is not because God didn't choose me. If God just would have chose me, I would have gone to heaven. They're in there and they know like, Oh, why did I reject Jesus? Oh, why did I why did I do that? Because they did reject Jesus. Did they reject Jesus? Yes or no? Yes. Now we're talking on a deeper theological thing is what were they so sinful that they had a were they so broken? And this is everybody believes that humans are broken. The question is how broken? Are they broken enough that like, hold on, I think I need God here to help fix me? Or are they so broken that they're like just brain is mush? And like, they sinned so much that they were so destroyed that they couldn't have even chosen what to do. But their choices is what brought them to that condition. My only answer to that is it's not actually what we see happening in any glimpse of Scripture. People seem to have enough recognition that they're like, oh gosh, I screwed up. And they seem to know it. They seem to know their rejection. Um, we see this, um, the other picture that we get kind of in this great white throne judgment is that everyone in hell is kind of dumped out. And those that have... Um, and, and again, it's just like this little brief glimpse, but there is this hatred of God still. There is this rejection of God. So, so they're not in heaven lamenting like, God, I would have worshipped you if I could have. Their lament is, they're, they're, they're enraged even more against God. 
uh, we get this picture that's playing out in this millennium kingdom when Jesus is literally here on earth and you can worship him and glorify him. And yet there are still people that want to surround the holy city of Jerusalem and like kill God. You know, they still want to rebel against God. And that is actually what is in the heart of people is that there is not a, they're not neutral and they're like, I didn't know there is a rejection of God, a hatred of God. I pointed out things, I've, I'll see little videos of like atheists talking, and when they talk about God, they talk about him with hatred. This isn't a, I had no idea. This is a, I don't think he's real, and I hate him. What? Like, what do you mean? Like, there is this rejection of God. And in hell, it isn't reformed. They're not in hell in that they're like, oh, I I really made a huge mistake, forgive me. It is a, they rebel even harder against him. And it isn't a, like God didn't make a mistake. And when he kind of shows this in this great white throne judgment, those names found written in the book of life are saved and brought into eternity in heaven. And those whose names are not found written in the book of life continue on um, in the lake of fire. And again, like I, I hate thinking about that. I hate imagining that. But it is, and this is where we get back to this first set of verses. When we get back here to the beginning, what is it that he wants us to do? Pray for all people. And does God answer prayers of people? Yes. Yes. He answers prayers. And I want you to pray. There is no person that is too far gone. There is no person whose hatred of God is too great. There is no person who has rejected God too long while they are still here on this earth. There is no person like that. And so God can save any of them. And we pray for it. And now when you're asking me, why does God not save someone? If there's a person we love and we care about and they don't seem to have trusted Jesus as their Savior, what are we doing with this information? We are looking at them and saying, you know, like, we want to shake them. They're like, why would you not just trust Jesus? (laughs) And we don't get it because they're like, he's great. He's wonderful. Like, there is nothing not to love here. (laughs) And so, but the answer isn't that, the answer isn't that, like, God is to blame for not saving them even though we know he can. And this is the, the tension. This is, the, this is what trusting God looks like. If God did everything that made perfect sense to us and he just agreed with us all the time, <laughs> if God agreed with me in every instance, I wouldn't actually have to trust him because trust is the things where it's like, God, this isn't going the way I wanted it to and this isn't going the way I thought it would and I trust you anyway. I also trust God in the ways that God does things behind the scenes that I don't fully understand. And, and let me, let me say, I'm literally fully understand. I'm saying it the other way, that God is doing things and I don't know about it. Meaning God could be doing something and like, I'm like, why aren't you doing it, God? And he's like, I am doing it. What do you think I'm doing over here? Like, what do you think? You can't see he's invisible. He could be doing things behind the scenes and I'm like, we're saying, why aren't you doing anything? And he's like, I am doing things. Why aren't you doing anything? I am. Why aren't you saving this person? I am saving them. <laughs> he he desires for people to be saved and I'm praying into that <laughs> and when I got people I love and care about that don't seem to be trusting Jesus as their savior I am holding on to this I'm praying that and I'm like alright God I know you desire for people to be saved and I, I want to see this person saved and you start you pray it and you pray it and you pray it and you depend on God for it as best as you, um, as best as you know how. And if it doesn't seem to go the way you wanted, A, you could be wrong. And God did do something. You did save someone you didn't know they did. There will be, uh, I've heard this expression that you are going to be so surprised who is and isn't in heaven. <laughs> I think there are going to be people there who are like, I did not see that one coming. Uh, and I think there might be people like, that person didn't? <gasps> they were lying the whole time? Um, and I can only guess, when we get to heaven, it's going to make sense. 
It's going to make sense. There is going to be this explosion of glory that we've been holding back because we haven't been able to trust God perfectly. None of us have. So there's this a piece of us that's holding back praise because we're like, I don't know if you're doing this exactly right, God. I think I think I could do this better than you is really what we're kind of saying. And, and I'm not actually attacking any of you for that <laughs> statement. Like I'm kind of saying like, we think that like if I was God for a day, <laughs> this, 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 like we would do all these things. And the really is if we knew what God knows, we'd be like, oh God, you're actually doing really well right now. And he's like, I know, I know. <laughs> and, and we're like, I'm sorry. He's like, you're forgiven. Hug it out. Uh, and so I think we need, like, we need to see our helplessness. We can't make people get saved, even though we'd want to. You can't choke people into salvation, even though you wanted to. We can lean on that God desires for people to come to the knowledge of the truth. And now that we are dependent on God for people to save them, or even if, again, people do have, they have a choice to reject, to re- choose or reject, we are praying for God to do a, an Apostle Paul, like, just burn his eyes out until he believes kind of. <laughs> kind of moment. Pray for it. Pray for it. Was there any other hand in the back that I missed? Yes, Faith. I'll allow it. If we had a, <laughs> if we, I, I think of like the burning building, I'll get you. Uh, she said so much. It's so good. Um, I'll sum it up with a little illustration because we do need to move on. Uh, the illustration I tend to use for that is like if there's a burning building and a fireman runs in and, you know, there's like, the backdraft, I saw the movie, like, boom, it, like, sucks up with a fireball, and they're like, oh, he's so brave, and he comes running out with, like, two kids over each shoulder and comes running out. You know, the headlines are always, like, you know, hero fireman, you know, runs in the burning building, saves two children. The headline doesn't usually say, like, fireman runs in the building, lets eight people die heartlessly. Like, he saved two. And you love it if one of those two is your kid, and you're kind of angry at that fireman if he grabbed two kids and one of them, like, the next room over was your kid. Uh, And we look at God and we're like, okay, yeah, I guess I'm thankful you saved two, but then, like, your arms are huge, God. Why didn't you grab all ten? And we don't... He doesn't give us a clear enough answer. And, yeah, so what Faith was saying is that we see throughout Scripture that he, everyone deserves hell, and he chooses some. He chooses Jacob, and he didn't choose Esau. And Jacob and Esau, neither one are, like, really good people. <laughs> There's no story about Jacob and Esau that, like, oh, yeah, Jacob's the good one. Like, no, he's pretty deceptive. And what about Esau? Like, yeah, he's kind of a jerk. <laughs> like, like, they're both kind of bad. So it's not saying that, like, I picked the good one and rejected the bad one. He's like, ugh, they're both 
nightmares. I'm choosing this one. And makes him something and does something. And so we don't get to look and say, like, we, we come with a starting point of understanding. We're not starting neutral. We're all starting destined for hell. And the fact that he saves some is worthy of glory. Is worthy of glory. All right, last, I'm going to wrap this up quickly. Uh, our role, this is Paul's words here, but I think this is the way we should do it. For this I was appointed as a preacher and apostle. And the parentheses are there in Scripture. They put it in parentheses to kind of help you see the tone. It's like a uh, participial phrase. He says, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. <laughs> a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I think it is really funny that like the Apostle Paul writes something and he says, I am not lying. Does that make it seem like he was lying in other areas? I don't think so. I don't think we were supposed to say, like, unless he says he's not lying, it's 50-50. I, I think he's saying, as we've seen here this morning, this is tough. He's like, I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. God, God wants people to come to salvation. He is the perfect medium between God and men. I'm appointed to just preach this stuff. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. Teach the Gentiles faith and truth. So one of the, the, the takeaway from that for me is, all this stuff is so difficult and so challenging. And many times when we talk about in Christianity, crazy sounding, it is crazy sounding that we have to be people marked with telling the truth. That if people catch you lying all right, about things, they're going to not trust a word you say. They need to see that in, in circ all circumstances, you are a trustworthy person. That as a trustworthy person, that even if you are saying something that sounds difficult and hard to understand, that they're like, well, but they're not a liar. They're not a liar. They are telling the truth. And at least they believe it's the truth. And that's if the best I can do to some people that be like, you know, I don't know about this God stuff, but I know Joe believes it. I don't know about this whole Holy Spirit stuff, but I know, I know Joe believes it because he doesn't lie. Uh, he tells the truth. He's not a liar. So he believes it. I guess I should probably figure this out more. So even if they don't believe it, at least their takeaway should be they know you believe it because you don't lie. You don't lie. And when I think about application, you pray and you trust God to do his job. And when I think to myself, why do people not pray? They, they don't pray because they think too highly of themselves. And I can fall into this category of I think I can solve the problem. I think I can do it. I think I can convince someone to be saved. I think I can share it well enough. I think I can uh, do this and do that and solve problems. I think I can solve uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict if they put me in charge. I think I can solve it. Um, that's a stupid thought. <laughs> I can solve. I, that is so much pride and hubris in that, to thinking I can do that. So one of our challenges in prayer is thinking too highly of ourselves. And the other problem with prayer is thinking too little of God. Our problem sometime in prayer is we say things like, well, I know God could do that, but I just don't think he will. Why don't you think he will? Why do you think so little of God? Again, I'm not yelling at you. Why do you think so little of God that he won't do the really kind, incredible thing that you want him to do? We tend to like hold back our prayers because we think like, God won't do that. Why do you think that? Why would you think that? So either, whether you are falling more in the category, maybe it's probably both at different times in your life, where you're like, no, I got this, God. You can take this one out. I'll take it. You can sit on the sidelines. I'll, I'm going to put God on the bench. I'm going to take the final shot. And God's like, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> or we're saying like, ugh, I know God could hit that final shot, but I don't think he will. Why do you think he will? Why do you think he will? Um, so don't think too highly of yourself and don't think too little of God. Um, and that is why we pray. <laughs> that is why we pray for this stuff. And we pray, and we're going to talk about next week, is we're going to introduce that concept with prayer as well, where he again talks about the importance of prayer, and he actually kind of yells at guys more than anybody else. He says, men, I, I need you to pray. You are the ones that tend to be at fault in this area of thinking too highly of yourself and thinking too little of me. But let's Take pause there and pray. <laughs> Jesus, I pray that we are a people of prayer, that we, we know our limitations, how extreme limitations that they are, that our limitations are even greater than we realize. And um, We have you 
who is so much greater than we could ever realize, so much more powerful than we could ever imagine. And we do just pray for your, your strength to be seen, your might to be revealed, your heart uh, to be experienced. We know that you love Uh, We know that there are people that we love, uh, that we would love to see come to a saving knowledge of you. And, you know, we're sitting here on the sidelines and saying, all right, we we know you you love them, so save them. Um, God, give us wisdom on what you want us to do. Let us be faithful to what you have called us to do. Uh, Let us be quick to share um, your love and your faithfulness and your, um, your grace with all people. We are praying that uh, you are just continually drawing people to yourself. We are praying that um, whatever the challenges, whether big international conflicts like Israel and Palestine or little interpersonal conflicts that we might be having, that we are people of peace, that we are people of dignity and godliness. Uh, and that we are a people that display our dependency on you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.